What brought you to an interest in brains originally? So what really brought us there is uh, talking to the, a lot of the clinicians and the surgeons who do these surgeries and they're looking at the tools they had and they came to us and said, look at these devices. This is what we have to work with. <clears throat> and so I at the time they were implanting those devices for so they uh, implant them both for looking at epilepsy uh, and also deep brain stimulation okay. for Parkinson's, for example. So that was uh, for a research purpose to study epilepsy, but also for a therapeutic purpose in Parkinson's to yeah, reduce the tremors. Correct, and it's also, um, even for therapy for epilepsy, for example, they may open up the skull and put a large electrode net over the surface of the brain, trying to localize where the epileptic center is coming from. And so they'll do that, and then they'll have to put the skull back on, let the patient recover for a few days because of the trauma of the surgery, and then try to look at uh, exactly where it is, and then they'll resect that region. And what well, was really profound to us coming from a kind of a nanotechnology background where we're used to making very small devices is how large and bulky all the neuroscience devices are right now. And so that was a clear way to use our expertise coming from the nano side of things uh, to make an, an impact in neuroscience that really would help people in their lives. So there are other um, teaching hospitals around the world that have uh, incredible universities connected to them. There are a lot of nanotech researchers around the world. Um, why you? Why were you? Why was your lab the one to to uh, implement that approach? That <coughs> oh. approach? Well, we're not the only lab doing these kind of devices. There are absolutely a lot of other incredible researchers doing really neat work to try to interface brains to computers. And we all take our, based on our own experiences, we take different approaches to it. And so we have our own particular approach that we've developed, which is just go as small as possible and showing that that can be very well accepted by the brain to go in with very small devices, won't harm the brain. And then you can do many of them in parallel. Uh, but there are, it uh, seems kind of yeah. obvious to just make the device smaller and you talked about how unwieldy they were mm -hmm. when you when you first started looking at the field. Mm -hmm. What were some of the challenges? Why, why wouldn't anyone just shrink them down? Uh, <clears throat> there are several challenges. One is just how do you insert something? How do you handle something that's that small? If I give you a, a human hair, that's about 10 times thicker than our probes. So how do you handle those probes is a real question. And then how do you connect them up? Uh, electrically to something that is going to go to your computer. That's also a big challenge. And so before people had been doing one or two or uh, a few at a time, but that just doesn't scale. And so that's why we had to come up with something different that not only was that small, but could connect to a chip in thousands and tens of thousands all at once. Wow. So there, there are two innovations out there. Let's drill on, on both of those. How do you get something as thin as a hair? to insert itself into the brain. Yeah, so we did uh, one of the first systematic studies by looking at probes of different sizes, starting at a hair around 100 microns, and then stepping down carefully and watching what happens. And so we actually visualized as the probe goes in, what happens to the blood vessels in the body? What happens to the neurons as probes of, of this very small size scale went in? And that is the first kind of very systematic study of that. And what we saw is that the um, observation of bleeding went down dramatically once you started getting 50 microns and below. So everything that was before we would consider small at, oh, it's the size of a human hair. But of course, there's nothing that says a human hair should go into the brain, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so once we drop down below 50, we see dramatic reduction in bleeding. And in fact, once you go below 20 micron in size, we never see bleeding. And that was really remarkable. And we had a number of our colleagues kind of follow up, show that that's really the case. Wow. That's fascinating. It has parallels to the Wright brothers um, who realized that the propeller was one of the big limitations on developing a functional aircraft and actually were the first people anywhere in the world to just go back to basics and build a test bench and test every single iteration of different angle of a propeller and different size. Yeah, it's so interesting. You had to do how, that fundamental work. Yeah, that's right. It's often like you have an insight, but then it's all the hard work to actually do all the measurements to really figure out what's going on and how to address it that comes after that bit of inspiration. And I still don't understand exactly how you get the force to push such a thin filament into brain tissue. It seems like it would just bend and collapse. Do you need 
something around it to support it as it goes in or that would defeat the purpose? That's a very good question because if I use a soft polymer for example that's that small it'll just crumple up on mm -hmm. the surface so in fact we want to use something that's relatively stiff uh, uh, so that it can support itself and push into the tissue and you'd say ah but it's stiff uh, doesn't the body react against that, right? Uh, it turns out at that small scale, the body tissue and the device moves together. And we don't see the kind of immune reaction that you do with a larger device. So that's also been kind of a discovery that uh, small enough means that you don't get a large immune response. And how did you solve the connecting these uh, hundreds or thousands, how, how many in a typical? Yeah, so thousands um, yeah. in a typical array. And the way that we did it, it was we looked at devices that are around us. So we have devices probably in your pocket right now that have millions of individual pixels on them. So either a phone display uh, or your camera will have millions of pixels that basically sense voltage. So why don't we use those to connectorize to these thousands of wires? And so we basically make a direct interconnect between CMOS chips uh, and our wire probes. So no connectors in between, and then that will really miniaturize the whole package. Wow, so that's taking an idea that was originally used to make thin screen displays, but now using it to make thin sensor that's right. Yeah. Um, so you can do camera chips will do your sensing or if you have a display, then that can actually stimulate current through each little pixel and we have control of every single one. You presented some of the early ways uh, in which this is already getting used. Um, I know that your technology has been spun out into startup companies that have developed tools for making implants into the brain. How do you where do you see it going over five, 10, 20 years as this technology gets rolled out? What, how is the world going to be different? Well, I think the first thing is we really want to do restoration. So people who are locked out, who can't speak, we can start to look at the brain function, which is still fully intact, and then communicate with the outside world. So I think there's a large number of neurological diseases. We can start to at least, we can't cure them, but we can address some of their functionality. And that's going to be the next five to 10 years is really starting to address a, a number of those problems. Farther than that, you can imagine, all right, now that we have that interface, what might you do with that? And that's kind of an exciting question. I don't know. We're going to find out what people kind of innovate based on this technology. Interesting. And, and when they do start innovating, they're also going to think about not just therapeutic uh, uses, but enhancement mm -hmm. uses. There's a huge amount of interest <clears throat> in the space already. Elon Musk funded uh, Neuralink and Brian Johnson funded Kernel. Mm -hmm. Where do you what do you think is realistic for uh, private companies doing brain machine interfaces in the next couple of years? Well, I think especially the next couple of years, doing augmentation is a really challenging task because we don't even know how the circuits work right now. For example, I might look in the speech uh, cortex and say, oh, this pattern creates this particular word. If I repeat that pattern, do we get the word out? We don't know. So something as basic as a simple uh, input-output relationship doesn't exist yet. So I think it's a little early to start saying that we're going to be able to upload consciousness mm -hmm. or things like that. Um, but that might be possible down the road, but we're not there. What we do now for stimulation, for deep brain uh, stimulation, is we excite an entire lobe, uh, not a lobe, a, a region of the brain. And then that counsels the tremor. But what within that circuit that we stimulate, we're really doing, we have no idea. And so that's the kind of uh, level that we're at right now. So we have a, a ways to go before we're gonna be able to do very precise manipulations in and out. How is the experience of this conference for you as a scientist uh, having this mix of people here? Oh, it's terrific. I mean, it's really important because it stretches you, uh, both multidisciplines into other scientific regimes, but as you mentioned with the philanthropists there, it also stretches you to make things practical, right? It really puts the emphasis, okay, that's great science. How are you gonna make something that makes an impact on society? And so I think that kind of dynamic is terrific. What is a definition of consciousness for you? That's a really hard one. I've thought about that before, but it's such a nebulous thing. Is it just the controller that kind of takes all the input and then decides what to do next? Um, but it seems like it's more than that. And yet to define it is incredibly difficult. So I don't have a good scientific characterization yet. And if, if we did, I think you'd be able to do uh, something that might reproduce it, but we're not there.